All right. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Savan. Great to be here. Yes, we we've uh, connected and and known each other uh, online for m- several years. That's right. Uh, That's but right. This, is, this is the first time we're sitting down having a conversation. Uh, I've listened to you through through video, um, starting out on Periscope and then lately Instagram uh, is is uh, where I'm I'm um, I'm following you. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about uh, mi- your ministry, about ministry, um, but but also your family. Thank you. Me too. You know, it's funny you bring up Periscope. It, uh, you know, it kind of feels like the MySpace of online video or something. Like I, I it is still going on. I think, or it was just was sort of like this flash in the pan, at least in my own life, and. Um, that was a cool way that we were able to connect, uh, you know, many, many years ago and um, been grateful to, to keep up with you and to watch what you've been doing uh, as well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. The per- Periscope, you know, it, it, we haven't continued on it, but it was uh, useful in, in learning just how to be brave and hit the record button and just that's right uh, on video. Um, That's right. That was the first time I'd ever gone, you know, live and kind of had to do something and talk to a camera and uh, sort of imagine that there's an audience out there. And we were sort of all cutting our teeth on that. And um, it takes a lot of practice, but that that was a that was kind of a new and scary thing to do. I I still remember that feeling of like, okay, am I going to push the button now and then and then you gotta go you know and then you're out there and you're out there yeah Yeah. and then well or then there's like that like 15 second or 30 second lag you know because people have to sort of jump on if they're going to jump on and you're just kind of you know waiting to see (laughs) you know what what happens so yeah yeah we we've uh done different things online um i as a counselor i'm usually talking about mental health things and um uh but uh and you uh often do uh devotional like uh and uh inspiring uh videos uh and Mm -hmm. you can you can continue to do that um the so i if we have time i i'd be uh interested in in talking to you more about your thoughts on like ministry through social media uh but yeah the but the That's main thing question. yeah the, the the main thing as a, a fellow dad and husband was i wanted to, mm-hmm. to to just get your perspective and talk to you about uh marriage and and family mm-hmm. and uh, so mm-hmm. could you share with uh listeners uh y- y- your background and and a little bit about uh your family and 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 the uniqueness of your, your, your marriage and, and your family. Yeah. So um, my wife and I um, will celebrate 23 years, I guess it is. Yeah. This, this November, we were married in November of 98 and um, we quickly found out within a couple of years um, that we weren't going to be able to have kids of our own. And while that was a really difficult thing to to come to know about ourselves and our marriage and um, our life together, um, a, a door opened up or an opportunity opened up to consider adoption. And so um, we looked at all sorts of possibilities, um, overseas adoption, maybe private adoption here in the States, but we landed on um, adopting through foster care. And we were living in Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe, actually, at the time. And we became licensed foster parents. And um, over the span of a couple of years, we had 13 kids come through our home. And that that was sort of the um, way that God invited us into uh, parenthood. And um, it was... And has continued to be um, 
you know, the hardest, best thing that uh, my wife and I have, have been a part of. And we've been a part of a lot of neat things <laughs> and mm -hmm. campus ministry with, with college students and uh, mission work um, around the world. Um, and yet it's really this work of grace and of prayer and of, of growth and of challenge of foster care and adoption within our home that's been the most challenging and the most, I, I want to say the most rewarding, <laughs> you know, mission, uh, you know, that, that we've been on. And so that, that kind of sets the stage, Sylvan, for kind of the, it's uh, foster care and adoption isn't unique, but that, that maybe is what is, uh, you, you know, unique about us relative to, to perhaps um, many of our friends and kind of in our circle, we were, we were one of the first people that I knew actually uh, was Jill's parents, my wife, her parents were foster parents. And that that's what kind of put us over the edge of saying, hey, let's look at this. And, you know, the reason that we did was it has a lot to do with my wife. Um, she is in general, a, and I'm not just saying this, a lot of times, uh, you know, husbands might defer to their incredible wives, uh, but this is really true. I mean, she's just mm. much more generous <laughs> than I am in spirit, just in general. And she, she really wanted to go and love and serve kids uh, where there wasn't um, a line, you know, kind of lined up. And we didn't want to get in front of anybody else who maybe had a call to adoption, whether it was overseas or private adoption. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to go someplace where uh, kids were waiting for a home rather than parents were waiting to adopt. Wow. And, uh, and so that's why it's in part why we chose foster care. Um, and uh, through those th 13 kids who came through our home in a couple of years, we adopted four sons uh, in Phoenix. And then there are teenagers now, you know, 14 to 19. And they all came in the home, you know, kind of uh, really about one year and under. Uh, and now they're in high school and just out of high school uh, these many years later. Wow. The uh, so pretty early on, you 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 made that decision to to do uh, foster parenting, and uh, that's right. Yeah, the uh, with her uh, her family and and her parents being foster parents, did, did you guys make that decision from um, you know trying uh, on your own to? focusing on foster parenting pretty quickly or did you try different things with infertility yeah you know we that's a good question about the the trying different things with infertility we we really didn't we really didn't i mean other other than you know some basic kind of dietary changes and some other kinds of things just you know um but it it was um We'll just say that the, the, the diagnosis was pretty clear that um, I, and I say that, you know, God gave us, I've said this before, and I think it's true, uh, the gift of infertility, uh, the way in which uh, he has sort of demonstrated his love for us is, mm. is sort of withholding uh, the gift of fertility and, and, and giving us a different gift, uh, the gift of infertility. Uh, and it pretty quickly we embraced it. Trust you. Um, you've got a good plan, kids. We're, we're, we're broken, broken hearted about that. Um, but we quickly had a sense that this was a, a good. There was a good that God wanted to bring out of the the difficulty. I mean, if you look at the scriptures and you look at at many many Christians, you know, uh, their lives aren't perfect by any kind of worldly standard um but they have a perfect we have a perfect savior and and he sort of brings good out of difficulty consistently mm -hmm. and so we just wanted to and, and did you know place our trust in that truth and um but we did look at like we so we we didn't do a whole lot um and again i uh for, for your listeners um i'm a i'm a roman catholic and so we, you know, there's particular kind of thoughts around, um, around, around methods to conceive. And so, you know, we're, 
were very particular around there, there, there wasn't a whole lot we could do to try and uh, to try. We, we didn't feel like to conceive in other ways. Um, like we chose not to pursue like an in vitro, you know, situation and, you know, based on, on, on what the church teaches um, for us about, about in vitro fertilization. Um, and so that was, that was not something that we um, were going to pursue. And so, we we just wanted to trust God with that, and we looked at uh, we looked at international adoption. In fact, my my wife and I went to Mexico and and did a, a mission trip uh, there, and we were at a, a couple of different orphanages. And if my wife could have, I mean, she would have like smuggled them under her <laughs> you know jacket and, and tried to cross the border. I mean, she just was so eager, you know, to to welcome you know a child in need into our home, but. Um, that was complicated and that wasn't really how it was going to work. And um, we had even worked with a couple of, of families who, um, you know, their daughter um, got pregnant and they were considering um, abortion and yet also considering adoption. And we were working with a couple of those kinds of situations too, that never panned out. Although thankfully uh, those, those babies were, were carried to term and so there, there were a number of kind of unique situations that we were connected to, but ultimately landed on uh, the call to foster care um, and have been kind of at it, if you will, um, ever since. Yeah. The, you've had uh, 13 kids uh, in, in your home uh, uh, over yeah. the years. Uh, what, were, uh, what were some of the things that you needed to learn uh, as a couple and um, in, in terms of how foster parenting af affects uh, your marriage as a couple? Yeah, we, um, we needed to learn that the kids who would come into our home had a story that was their story. Um, and they had a birth mom and dad, and they have a, a birth grandparent and, you know, grandparents, and they have a whole context. They have uh, things of their own, you know, there's nature that they're bringing to the table, their own, you know, DNA, uh, their experience of life um, outside of our home, even if it's just for a few days or a few years. Um, these are not our children. Um, and it's very likely that things will be different than maybe it would have been had we, you know, had our own, had our own kids. And so we can't just expect to kind of parent the same way that we might have, you know, had we had our own kids and maybe they would have been a bit more like us uh, in, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and their story would have been more known to us. But there's a lot of unknowns to, to foster care. And you have the, the reason that they're in foster care to begin with. So there's some kind of abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. And so automatically, you, you have to bring a trauma-informed perspective to parenting. We, didn't, we would have been trained to understand that concept, but to live that concept and to parent according to those principles it's not it's not uh it doesn't come natural it's not intuitive uh and we had to learn a whole lot about what i guess i'd say trauma informed parenting looked like and the way in which um to just to give you a simple example um just how 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 do consequences work um, how does withholding, say, a snack or, um, you know, uh, you, you know, having someone do a timeout, um, how do they experience further rejection mm -hmm. because you, in a sense, put them in a room all by themselves? It would have been very natural to me growing up. I might have experienced a timeout as a kid, or you need to go to your room. Okay, fine. That was my punishment. Well, that may or may not work in this kind of situation. And that's just one of, of, of many examples. 
And so the, the trauma informed parenting took a long time to really understand what that meant and then how to do that in a good way. Um, and it took us, it took us years um, to learn the, if you will, the ways of, of trauma informed parenting. And so that was, that was the most difficult. Um, and then the other piece I would add is because, because you are, because we experienced infertility, you, st- you, it was really hard to look at, um, foster care and not see it as a way of fulfilling or kind of filling a hole in your life. Mm -hmm. So infertility kind of creates this vacuum or uh, this longing or desire to be, to be parents. Mm -hmm. But the goal of foster care uh, isn't adoption. The goal of foster care is reunification with birth families. And so it means holding it all, holding their future, particularly as it relates to your family, very loosely and actually working towards them not being a permanent part of your family first. That's hard to do, Mm -hmm. especially when you're, you're kind of wrestling with the pain of infertility for instance, even though we had a, I think we had a positive orientation to infertility. Um, there's still this sort of innate pain and hurt. And then I'll just go one step further. I experienced the loss of my, of my father um, from an early age. My, my dad had Alzheimer's disease from the time I was five until I was 23. And so I watched my dad fade away, you know, in front of me and never really knew him. So you have kind of this fatherlessness in me and then infertility and then the pain of parenting, the difficulty or confusion of parenting the, the other, if you will, someone that isn't, isn't your child. And yet you're entrusted with this great, uh, you know, this great responsibility um, and the goal isn't long-term, you know, permanency in your home until it is, you know, and then, and then that happened, you know, in four of our 13 situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those were the, those were the unique challenges I think that we had um, in, in, that we had to learn in the first three, four, five years of, of uh, being foster parents. Yeah. And still, gosh, still, I'm still today. I mean, literally even today, I'm dealing with the challenges and difficulties of um, what, what it means to be a generous, loving, trauma-informed, uh, now adoptive uh, dad. Adoptive dad uh, of, of teenagers. Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, if teenagers weren't hard enough, you know, you throw the the foster care, the adoption, the trauma history, the various developmental challenges that are there. It's hard enough as it is. Uh, and then you throw COVID and then you throw screens in there and then you throw hormones and look out. Yes. <laughs> it's really tough. And, the, and this is why you have a, a prayer ministry. <laughs> and you do. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. That's very so true. You, you had to, to learn. It sounds like trial and error and, and some, some challenging things uh, early on with, with being trauma informed. Were there any uh, resources or, or um, mm-hmm. that, that stood out that, that you can remember yeah. that were helpful? Yes. Um, well, number one, um, the therapists that supported our kids, number one, mm-hmm. uh, we first, we, we were, we were really for, my wife has an orientation to getting seeking the support and services that are available to, you know, kids in crisis. And so if it wasn't, it, first, it was just like speech therapy and that sort of thing, just some basic kind of stuff like that and other developmental things early on and then occupational therapy. Um, and then we got into, you know, some of the EMDR techniques in, in therapy and then um, non-directive play therapy and then into talk therapy, the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, for all of our kids. 
And I would find, I'll tell you what, the best thing, oh, the best thing that would happen was the conversations before and after those meetings. You know, a lot of times uh, there'll be a consult with, with the therapist, kind of an update. You know, how are the kids doing? Uh, what are we walking into today? That kind of thing, you know, brief little thing before they, they meet with the, the kids. The kids are out in the waiting room or whatever, and then we're talking to the therapist. And then the debrief a little bit afterwards. Um, those were the moments that were most supportive to me um, because I had somebody who understood what what was going on. I didn't feel like such an alien. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. we're surrounded by uh, as we're surrounded by these big, happy, healthy, seemingly holy Catholic families, and here we are, kind of the the odd couple over here trying to mm-hmm. do foster care and adoption, and um, and so just no one could kind of understand the challenges we were going through. So, but the therapist did. And so between the books that we read, um, and of course, I'm trying to think of a few that I would, uh, Beyond Consequences was probably one of the best, but, um, but those therapists, and then it finally led to us getting our, you know, our own therapists and, and working through the, the, the mental health support that, that we needed uh, in giving, giving of ourselves to, to this sort of work. But boy, uh, I could still, still remember um, in the thick of it, um, if I could tell you a, a, a funny, a good story actually about that, my, my oldest son, um, was sort of the first one into this non-directive, uh, play therapy setting. And, um, they had, they had it such that there was a, uh, like a one-way mirror. So the therapist was on the other side of the mirror. And then we were in the playroom together, myself and my oldest son, and, I would wear this like he- these headphones and uh-huh. the, the therapist would kind of co- coach would coach me. And they're coaching you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Right. They're coaching me mm-hmm. because it's not, it's not intuitive. So the non-direct, I mean, you know this better than I do, but the, the non-directive play therapy is, is just narr- narrate what they're doing. Uh, don't give any direction um, and don't necessarily ask any questions. And both just, of those things observing. were not Yes, just observing, narrating, uh, j- just sort of giving feedback to them to what they're doing. And that isn't intuitive. And certainly it wasn't intuitive to me. I'm very much like, okay, here's what we need to do. Here's what you need to do. And a lot of answers. And even if I'm not given answers, let's ask good questions, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, my, <laughs> my oldest son, uh, part of it was a sign. He, he was smart. He's, he is a really smart kid. Um, and I, he, he, there were some handcuffs in the room and we would play different games. And then finally he thought, I have an idea. I'm going to handcuff dad to this shelf and I'm going to run right out of the, <laughs> run right out of the therapy room. And what can I do? You know, I, I was, I couldn't say no, I, you're now you're handcuffing me to the shelf, you know, and I was giving that feedback, but, um, so he he got me on that one, uh, and that was that was pretty good. But you know what I learned in in so much of that was um, I thought that when the kids escalate, I had to beat them to the top of the hill. Essentially, I I if they were going to be loud, I had to be louder, mm. and that's what I thought being a good dad was was in a sense being in charge, being being the biggest and the loudest and the strongest. Mm. And what I've learned is it's the opposite of that. It's, uh, it's actually the way of, it's the way of Jesus uh, mm. um, submitting himself uh, to the lowest position to be the one that, that serves. And I would find, and, and I still, um, that particular therapist helped me to see that when he starts to escalate, you need to, you need to de-escalate and he'll follow you. He'll follow you wherever you go. Um, and if you de-escalate, he'll start to de-escalate. And that was a game changing principle. Just one example. Um, and it, and it came out in those debriefing meetings, you know, before and after uh, therapy. Uh, so that was probably the best resource for me 
was the relationship, the personal relationship with their, with their many therapists. Yeah. You, you, you learned that in, in therapy, but it, 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 uh, aligns with what scripture teaches, you know, a gentle answer it does. turns away wrath. It does. And yeah, but you had to trust that, that your son would follow. Yeah. And you know, he did. He, I mean, he did in the sense that it was actually the only thing that really worked. You know, you, uh, <laughs> you try all sorts of things. You try being silly. You try being uh, aloof. You try being loud. You, 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 you try anything to kind of work with the, the challenging and difficult behaviors, none of which are really their own. So much of it is a response to the own, their own trauma that they're experiencing. They're just acting out so much of what they themselves have, have experienced. And so um, I, I finally learned that the, probably the biggest lesson I learned so on was the only thing that I can control is, and not even do it very well, but the only thing I have control of is myself, you know, um, self-control. Uh, I don't have any way of controlling anybody else. <laughs> and I, this, that wasn't intuitive to me, you know, um, the other, and part of it was I, I was a really good kid, you know, growing up, I was very, uh, I did everything on time and as well as I could and to meet my parents' expectations. Yeah. Um, and then to be in a situation where that was the, it was like the opposite of that. My, I mean, I was lost for a couple of years knowing how to handle that kind of the, the difference. Yeah, yeah. The, with your, your father's uh, health, health struggles, too, yep. you probably had to work really hard to, yep. to take care of yourself and to do well. Yep. And to, and you said it, uh, you, 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 oh boy, I, that, that was what I sort of took on was that, uh, you know, as the oldest child and as my mom is trying to deal with the challenges of, of my dad's um, de mental deterioration and then ultimately physical deterioration, um, I needed to be a help, not a challenge. And um, we kind of had the roles reversed he was more like the son and I was more like the dad in the home. Um, I would find my dad uh, in the shower with all of his clothes on. And then what do you, what do you do as like an 11 year old boy when you discover that, or we would laugh or he would come out and you'd have one of my mom's bras on over his shirt, you know, just these kind of like funny things, but that, you, you didn't laugh. It wasn't, wasn't funny then, you know, it was, it was disorienting, you know, or I saw my, my dad uh, having a, a, a negative reaction to some medication and he was hallucinating on the, on the couch and there wasn't cell phones and who could you call to That's help? Scary. I was home alone with him. Oh, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. Mm. Um, and so, yeah. I, I was not there to rock any boat. Um, now, some, some kids might have reacted that way, you know, rebelled perhaps. But for me, my, my instinct was not to rebel, with, but was to be a good, a good boy, you know. And I think I kind of expected that, you know, of, of my kids. But <laughs> that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't how it turned out. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yes, you're absolutely right. It's very, um, your intuition is really strong on, on that idea because that, that was the case for me. Mm -hmm. With uh, the, the lessons that you were learning, it sounds like lots of hard work, you know, you know uh, therapy yeah. For, yeah. for kids, lots of appointments, uh, lots of, <laughs> lots of uh, lear learning curve. Um, and... Uh, for, for listeners who are considering adoption or, or, or yeah. foster care um, yeah. out here in Portland, it, there's a strong movement for uh, uh, in, in the churches that we've been involved in and some friends locally uh, to be foster parents. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and then, you know, they're getting the training and 
the churches are help, supporting and helping uh, families who are making this decision, um, what would you say to, to encourage young couples who are yeah. um, considering it or, or starting out in it? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say um, it's, I, I've always looked at now, I have to say this idea came because I've observed, perhaps you're familiar, or perhaps some of your listeners are familiar with uh, North Point Community Church in Atlanta, Andy Stanley's church. Um, they, he would, Andy Stanley would speak a lot about years ago, I would hear him talking about their local church um, kind of deciding to, to help make a big dent in kind of the, the need for, for foster kids in their area. Or you take a church in a, a small county and they'd say, hey, we're going to, our church is going to step up over many years and, and provide the, the support that foster kids in our county, let's say, need. And I always thought, that's right. That's, that is, that, that is beautiful because the, there, there's not an infinite number of kids who need homes. I mean, there's a big number, but there's more happy, healthy, holy homes than there are kids who need them, but they just haven't been mobilized yet. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, it's a solvable humanitarian crisis. There's just a lot of revolving of like new kids in and new kids out, but there's more of us, if you will, like homes, good homes, uh, homes that can, can really be open to the challenges uh, that could provide for kids in crisis. And when you look at the early church, that was what was different about Christians. They were the ones who took in the kids who were abandoned. They were the ones who, who, who welcomed widows and orphans into their homes. And that set them apart from the rest of society. And it was a head scratcher for many people in the first few centuries, like what's going on with them? And it's a radical, generous hospitality that can only come from the just the imitation of the heart of God who, who welcomes the broken, who welcomes th those who are lost or who need a home or who, who, who can't find their way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, in, it's endemic to who we are as Christians to to love and serve this way and what i say is i think some ways i would like for me my wife because we were we had the you know infertility i would like us to be in the minority and that it would be actually bigger families uh families with a bunch of kids or a few kids that would look at becoming foster parents and the reason i say that is because what we didn't have was a healthy and strong culture in our family. Yeah. We, we, we created a culture in our family, but it was, it was dominated by the, uh, the lingering effects of kids who experience trauma. Yeah. And if, if, it's, if that's all that it is, it has a, a way of reinforcing itself that is quite difficult. But what if you had a family had three kids or five kids or two kids, and they had a culture that they could welcome other kids into, then uh, that becomes a really beautiful thing. Um, and so I would say families without kids or families with a bunch of kids, um, this is an opportunity we as Christians have to live the gospel in a very tangible way, to just continue to live our life and just add a couple of other seats at the table, a few more uh, meetings with social workers, a couple more appointments with therapists, and a big heart um, to love and serve you know, kids in need. We, we could be a part of solving that crisis. Um, you know, the, Jesus says in the scriptures um, that the poor, if you will, will always be with us. Mm. But I don't think that's true in the same way. There's a, there's a there's almost a, a sense of we can't get our number, the numbers that the, there's, there's, you know, poverty itself isn't going to go away, but I think we can make a, a meaningful dent in, in the need for kids who, who, who need a home um, as Christians. And I would love to see us 
you know, take a run at that. Oh, that's an awesome vision, Brian. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's amazing what, what your, um, your, you and your wife, uh, ha have taken on, um, as, as a husband, um, with, uh, just the, the, the hard work, uh, um, and, and just the, the ministry and, and just the love, uh, for, for the kids, um, as a husband, what have you learned in terms of supporting your wife when it, when it's hard? Mm. Yeah. You know, um, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge that I have is, um, not abdicating the, the God given role, um, that I have in marriage and in family. And I think for, for many of us, um, it's, it's a lot easier to sit on the sidelines, to let someone else do it. Particularly in my case, my wife, <laughs> my wife is a doer. Now, if it was just to take the two of us, I'm the one that, that I'm a thinker. I'm a strategizer. I can communicate and I kind of formulate ideas. Well, she's like, that's all well and good. We got stuff to do, <laughs> you know, and she goes and she's yes. a doer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait, you know, and she's like, we don't have time to wait. We got We got to act, you know, and sometimes I mean, nine times out of 10, she's absolutely right. There could be, a, you know, a really difficult or even unsafe situation that needs to be addressed. Let's go, you know. And so um, that's a natural kind of tension that we have. And so I think what I've, the, the challenge for me has been able to try and be as invested in my own way, in a way that honors uh, the investment that she has made and to allow her some downtime, to allow her some time uh, to recoup. And for me, you know, to play a, a positive, proactive, um, generous role. Because again, my, my, my nature is to be a bit more reflective, to be a bit more uh, um, slow, I guess, <laughs> you know, kind of slow to act. Um, and, and, I, and I have had to learn how to, to, not, to not just give in to that tendency um, and to not abdicate um, some of the responsibility I have. Now, I do think, I do think that there's a beautiful complementarity to my wife and I. And beyond the, the so-called roles that men and women are, say, supposed to play, um, you, you, you deconstruct that a little bit. And I think what you'll find, at least for us, is that there is a beautiful complementarity um, of gifts and of, of temperament. And, and I've seen that be a very good thing. Um, and it, it maybe doesn't fit into some of the more classic kind of roles that, that, that you know, a, a man is supposed to play or a woman is supposed to play, but we're trying to be, to fulfill this complement, complementing picture of what the kids need. Um, and to do so um, with love, but also with, with courage. And I think that's, uh, you know, this, the courage piece, that's where I've had to, my, my wife more naturally enters into dangerous situations than I do. Mm -hmm. That's, um, and I could talk more about that, but like, I, like she's, she, is, she is willing to go right at what feels like really scary situations. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't mean necessarily, I mean, sometimes it's, it's been actually, you know, physically dangerous situations of dealing with a, with some really scary behaviors or, you know, um, that sort of thing. But I think more emotionally challenging where, you know, confronting a difficult situation head on, I, I, I kind of more naturally pull back from that. And that's, Jesus has had to kind of walk me through the, and give me the courage necessary to address 
uh, difficult things and to not shrink back from them. Yeah. Um, because again, she, she's more natural in that. If I'm honest, I'm, I'm, I'm less oriented that way. And yet she needs me to be there with her and oftentimes to go before her in, into some of those situations, depending on what it is. Mm. Great. I, I, uh, I like uh, uh, what you said about the kind of the stereotypic uh, male and female roles. And yeah. for, for a lot of couples, it's like, well, that's, that's not really what we're experiencing or how it plays out for us. And sometimes yeah. um, the, the, the message, the implied message is that, oh, maybe there's, we're, we're doing it wrong or there's something yes. wrong with us. And yeah. like, oh, you're, you're finding the, the balance and, and learning yeah. how to complement each other. Um, but then definitely uh, helping each other grow in those different areas. Um, what you described is, is so much like my wife, Julie, and I. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So I, I um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just balancing grace and truth, right? right? Yeah. And um, right. Uh, but it sounds like you had to learn how to just like roll up your sleeves and kind of just jump in uh, and, and, and uh, support her and help her uh, as needed. Uh, so yeah, it's neat to hear how you're, you're working together as a team. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. the, um, we're, uh, I, I have two, uh, questions there, 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 or two things that they're, they're probably, they're probably related. Um, but, uh, I'm curious, uh, what this experience has been like in the area of like letting go in terms of like grief, um, mm -hmm. and, um, and then just your, your, your faith, how, how it's built your yeah. faith to have these situations where you're supporting these children to return. Um, yeah. 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 I think, um, you know, there, there has been, there have been, you know, some, some real seasons of grief, um, both, both in terms of just mourning the, the loss of, you know, our ability you know, to have kids uh, first, uh, second, kind of mourning the loss of expectations or some kind of ideal that I, I imagined was going to be true of me being a dad. Mm. Um, mourning the loss of, of even related to that, like I've said, and I don't know if this is true, but I thought, you know, um, Lord, like, Lord, why? <laughs> this has been really hard. It's been really good, but it's been really hard. Um, I, I would have been, I, I've said this and I don't know if it's a good thing to say, but like I've said, like if I had my own, I, I would have been really good at this, you know, or like I, I would have been just like these other guys who seem to be doing so well. And, you know, but that wasn't what God wanted for me. He, he, he wanted to put us into this unique kind of challenging situation to love these kids. And and I remember one particular day um, where the grief hit me um, and Jesus really turned it around was on Father's Day. Um, this is about seven, eight years ago. And the kids were being just, <laughs> we were trying to have like Father's Day breakfast, you know, yeah. and things got out of hand at the table and somebody threw some food or something. I, I don't know. There's just something like that. And they're, they're yelling at each other. And I just stormed out of the room thinking, you know, just guys, one, one day, maybe Father's Day, we could just, you know, mm -hmm. get through a meal without it being chaotic and crazy. And I just went back into my bedroom and just started crying and just weeping in my bedroom. And it was probably, I was loud, like the kids could hear me and I didn't sort of hold it back. And um, I wasn't like trying to draw attention to it. I just, just how I, where I was. And, yeah. and I had this sense of like, Lord, I, I feel like I, re I regret this. Did I, did I do the wrong thing? You know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, Jesus said, um, to me, or the word that was brought to my attention was the word gift. It's the word gift. And immediately I thought, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Lord. I, you know, <laughs> um, Jill and I, or I, I'm a gift to these kids. And he said, no, they're a gift 
they're my gift to you. Mm-hmm. And oh, did that hit me between the eyes that, that there is some healing, there is some growth, there is some trust in God, there is reliance on him. There is a relationship with God. There's intimacy with God that was only going to be possible because of this gift of my kids to me. And I actually kind of bristle a little bit when I hear people say, oh, you, you've given your kids such a great gift. And I think, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you're right. But, but what I really believe is that they've given me a much greater gift that is the opportunity to get to know God and his goodness and his plan for my life, his healing and growth in my life in a way that I'm not sure could have been known any other way. And so that's incredible. That's an incredible gift. And it's not about me. (laughs) In fact, it's about my brokenness and it's about how much he loves me. God loves me that he would provide a home for my kids and provide a home that, that they that they need and it's part of their plan for their life and at the same time bring transformation in my own and god wastes uh he doesn't waste anything and so he uses it all mm-hmm. and that that's been the kind of the core learning is is the nature of gift and what the gift is in this context and it's a little bit different than one might expect at least that's what i've experienced I, I asked you about letting go, but you, you told me about something that you received. That's a Father's Day you won't forget. I won't. And, um, and you know, the letting go was always the, my expectations, was always what I imagined was going to be the way. And still, I mean, still to this day uh, is, a, is a letting go, a shedding of what I want and, and the control that I expect to have around something that isn't under my control. And always reminding me that God is in control, that God loves these kids and me more than, than I love them or I even could love and care for myself. And so that's, that, there's been a tr- the freedom of, of what I'm describing does come first from that, that letting go. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so good, Ryan. The, um, our, our youngest is uh, finishing up her, her junior year and, you mm. know, we're, we're going to be empty nesters soon. Um, uh, but that, that letting go, uh, we, we do that. And then another season of life comes up again and we have to do it again in a new way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's um, that that that's a, a such a good place to to uh, for our time uh, today. But I did want to um, maybe as we wrap things up, I want to um, uh, give you a chance to share with listeners uh, uh, about your ministry. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, or or any uh, next steps that they might uh, uh, take with with being connected with you. Sure. Yeah, I mean the the there's this call that I've met my wife and had. It's more of a personal call to foster care and adoption, and um, that's I it's not connected at all to the professional work that I do. But the, professionally, I. I work with um, equipping uh, missionaries to go on campus around around the country, but then do I, I do a fair bit of of speaking and teaching as well. And um, one of the the places where that happens uh, is on Instagram, and uh, my Instagram handle is uh, Ryan C, as in Christopher Ryan C O'Hara, on Instagram. And would love to connect with your your listeners there and. Um, I will have to admit, though, I, I do. I sort of go in spurts. I have a, a kind of a love hate relationship, if I'm honest, with social media. Um, I kind of go on binges of of creating content, and then I'm like, oh, I can't keep up this pace, and I kind of give it up for a month, and then I just could connect, and I'd be honored to to connect with any of your listeners on some of the things we've been talking about. But I but I do share a a, a bit 
uh, through videos on, on family, on prayer, on sharing our faith and on foster care, all of these kinds of, of topics. Lately, I've been speaking a lot about, um, about prayer and how to grow in a, a daily relationship with God uh, through prayer. Yeah, it's um, the videos you do, they're, they're so, so well done. It's amazing how much I can learn from, from like a minute video. <laughs> or, or even yeah. a 30, 30 second yeah. video. So I really appreciate. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. When, uh, and and they build on each other. The lessons that, that yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're doing. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan, brother. It's been uh, 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 a blessing to um, be connected with you uh, through, through the years. Um, and and it's fun uh, because I think early on when we connected, I didn't realize you were Catholic, and Oh uh, yeah. 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 And then, and it's, and then I, I don't, I don't remember what it was like. Oh yeah. Uh, so Ryan's Catholic and he's listening to Andy Stanley and, yeah. you know, Craig Rochelle <laughs> and, you know, all these evangelical yeah, leaders yeah. and things like that. Like, right. Oh, that, so that, that's been a lot that's of cool. fun too. Yeah. Uh, to just appreciate yeah. your, your faith and your, and your, your perspective um uh, over the years has uh, like just definitely uh, edified my faith and encouraged me as as a dad so mm. just appreciate you Ryan oh, thank you oh, you're welcome likewise it's a great joy to to connect um in this way and uh, I hope we can connect again soon yes thank you for your time today thank you <laughs>